mode. Greetings, everyone, uh, to the Oregon Data Community uh, June meeting. Uh, my name is Vern Rock. Uh, tonight we have two presentations. So the, hopefully the first presentation will be uh, Paul Turley talking about some Power BI, and followed by Jessica Angular, also about some Power BI. Um, a little bit of intro stuff. Who are we? Oregon Data Community is a chapter of PASS, which is an international organization, professional association for SQL Server. Uh, we're one of many chapters. Most larger cities and even some smaller cities have a local chapter. Um, we have our monthly meeting. And we also have an event once a year uh, called SQL Saturday, which is an all day, as you might guess, Saturday event with uh, training sessions all day long. And it's totally free. And we have in the past been successful being able to give out free lunches in addition. Uh, this year might be a little different. We still haven't decided if we're going to have to go virtual or not, uh, which, of course, if we're virtual, there won't be any free lunches, but we will have it one way or the other. And that is scheduled for Arnie. When is it scheduled for? I can't remember the date. I believe that's November 4th, is my recollection. Okay. Okay. No, 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 that's wrong. We're at the end of, uh, I just, I'm bringing up the calendar now. Um, I should have one. Should be on the calendar there, but it. Uh, I don't, we're scheduled for October, end of October, whatever that is. October, okay. Um, that will be followed shortly by the end of past summer. Um, the summer is the Whoa. international. Hello, Paul. The summit is the international uh, organization's annual convention. Um, it has hosted for about 4,000 people. They've had it up in Seattle for the last several years. They had originally scheduled to have it down in Houston this year um, on November 10th to, tw to the 12th, or, and that's for the main three days. But it's going to be virtual this year, which is pro and con. You miss out on a lot of the networking but the price has dropped significantly. Um, if you want to attend the three main days of the summit, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, it's uh, $499 currently, the price will go up with time. And that also includes a year's worth of free download of the entire three days worth of, of material. For an additional $400, you can virtually attend the summits, which are all, excuse me, the, the uh, pre-cons, which are all day training sessions, Monday and Tuesday, and there's several of them. And again, you, that includes a year's worth of free downloads um, of all of the pre-cons. So that's really quite a good deal. And again, that's uh, November 10th through 12th are the three days, and you can, you can get online to the past summit um, and find it, how to register. Um, about our organization, want to go through our key people in our leadership group. As I said, my name is Vern Robbie. The beginning, the person that started this group years ago, 10 years, 11 years ago, was Arnie Rowland. He is, he is here tonight. Um, also in our leadership group and presenting tonight is Paul Turley. Also is Jessica Angular. She is in the leadership group and also presenting tonight. And I don't think he was showing up yet, but uh, Michael Wall is also in our leadership group. He said that he would be a little bit late. Um, and let's see, anything else? Um, at the end, I, normally we have a, a raffle when we have an in-person meeting and we pull out of a hat, a winner of a raffle, but. Um, since it's virtual, uh, we wait for the report to come back from uh, go to webinar of all the people that attended and do a somewhat random drawing out of that based on attendance. Um, and this for today's meeting, we will be giving away uh, a year's worth of training from Pragmatic Works, which is we're somewhere around thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars. I'm not sure what the retail is. Um, every other month, but not this month, we also include uh, Redgate SQL Cloud Uh Let's see, I think I've covered every, 
thing. Um, so all of the attendees, your microphones are muted. But if you have questions, uh, if you look over, well, it could be on your right by default. Uh, there's a little tab where you can enter a question and we will be monitoring those questions. Ah, there's Michael Wall. Uh, we'll be monitoring those questions and uh, either uh, have the presenter address them at the end or during based on how they how they fit in. So does anybody else in the leadership team have anything else to add to what I've said? Jessica, Michael, Paul, Barney? Uh, nothing, nothing here, Vern. I, I was just able to join. Yep, Paul's here. So that also means that Paul will be, as we hope, our first presenter. Our normal um, routine for our meetings is that we start out with a, we, we refer to it as a short session, anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes long. Um, sometimes, but not always, it's introductory level. Uh, obviously, for max of 30 minutes, we can't get too deep. Uh, and that's followed by our main presentation, which is anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. I'm not sure how long Jessica's will be tonight. Um, but that's our standard um, format, and that's the format that we'll be following tonight. So, Paul, are you ready? I am as ready as I'm ever going to be, Vern. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, my screen. So yeah. What's that? I said that's a yes. Okay. Um, I will make you the presenter. And why do I not see you in the list? Uh, because uh, GoToWebinar did not connect my audio or camera. So I'm using my cell phone, but I am, I have joined the meeting. Uh, uh, so we, in order to make you a presenter, you have to be on on the go to webinar. I have I have joined, but audio and uh, my my web camera doesn't work. So I've, yeah. I've made, I made Paul presenter, so you should be able to take control, Paul. Okay, let me uh, find the right screen to present. That is apparently screen of main monitor two. Okay, and yeah, I see him on there. He's right there. Got your screen. Right, so uh, let me sing my first slide. And we've got your video too. Yes. Good. Yeah, I just was able to turn the uh, webcam on. All right. Okay, well, hopefully, I, I uh, uh, my my sound is legible. For some reason, uh, go to webinar would not allow me to uh, use my computer audio, so I'm using my cell phone. Do I, do I sound okay? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, um, so Vern had mentioned that we often have an introductory uh, session. This is going to be a short session, but it's not going to be introductory. Um, so I'm going to talk about a fairly new capability of Power BI premium capacity um, that's uh, uh, used to do some more advanced things. And um, I, uh, I, I am going to ask my fellow uh, leaders to help me out um, by uh, monitoring some questions here. I'm, uh, I mean, we didn't set up a poll ahead of time, but of the 45 people who are in attendance right now, I would like to ask you just to chat to us. Uh, first of all, if you use um, Power BI, so uh, if if you uh, have experience with Power BI, I'm going to go ahead and chat a yes. And I'm gonna, let's see, we've got, now will that come up in the uh, questions, Mike or Vern? Uh, we've got uh, a, yes, chat, a, chat. Stop, a yes, a beginner. I see Jody, hello Jody. Yeah. Now I'm gonna ask another question. I'm, I'm still trying to, uh, I, I, I see one line. <laughs> one answer at a time. We got yeah. lots of those too. Undock that. There we go. I've got it. I just had to undock it. Um, I'm going to ask another question. Do you have prior experience using SQL Server analysis services outside of Power BI? Okay. Hello, Gary. We haven't, uh, we haven't chatted for a while. Gary actually helped us get set up at the uh, at the um, 
uh, OHSU facility there when we were, uh, uh, before we were quarantined. All right, so we've got, got some prior experience with analysis services, and that's important for this discussion. So let me jump in and, uh, and we'll get to the meat of this topic and do some demonstration. So leveraging the Power BI XMLA endpoint, and this really is focused on architecting enterprise scale BI solutions, building serious IT driven BI solutions, not uh, small lightweight uh, self-service solutions that, that we might create with Power BI. So what is this all about? Let me figure out how to advance my slide. So um, when, when you think about building a business intelligence solution, now analysis services has been around for a very long time. It's about, uh, that technology from Microsoft has been around for about 23 years now. Uh, originally released as OLAP services and SQL Server Analysis Services and SQL Server 2000. And, uh, and, and it's matured ever since. And that's really been kind of the, 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 the center stage of a Microsoft uh, technology or Microsoft platform business intelligence solution. That semantic model, formerly multi-dimensional cubes, and then later, as of about 2012, um, Microsoft put their focus into the in-memory technology, what we call tabular model. And you really have two choices for where to put your, your data model. And that could be um, analysis services. We're going to talk purely about cloud services today. So I'm going to refer to this as Azure Analysis Services. Essentially, that SQL Server Analysis Services hosted in the cloud. And of course, that's a pay-as-you-go kind of thing, like everything in, in the cloud is. And you can see that there are a number of service tiers as you look at this, this slide that uh, you can start it with, with, an, with an S0, a standard, which is pretty lightweight. The estimated cost is about $600 a month to host uh, an AAS uh, S0 tier, all the way up to something that's really serious, where you've got a lot of memory, a lot of cache, you get storage, um, some, some uh, CPU horsepower behind that. You could spend up to $25,000. You can spend more. But um, the, the, the movement within Microsoft is to move all of this capability, capability, all of these features into the Power BI service. Now, that doesn't mean that analysis services is going away anytime soon. It just means that, that Power BI really is becoming the one-stop shop. You have a Power BI premium capacity tenant, then you don't need to light up a bunch of different services to be able to build BI solutions. Yeah, so that 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 answers the the why, and uh, the the idea is that using the XMLA endpoint, we can connect to published data sets within the Power BI service without having to use Azure Analysis Services. Um, at least for the, the semantic model. So as you can see, we can connect Excel, we can connect SQL Server Management Studio, uh, third-party tools like Tableau or, or any reporting tool that you want to use that knows how to talk to analysis services. You can connect using the XMLA endpoint. And development tools, so we see DAX Studio and Tabular Editor. And I'm, I'm going to actually uh, show you Tabular Editor a little bit later on. Okay. So let's talk about how you get this set up, and I'm actually going to show this to you really quickly um, because Power BI Premium is not cheap. Um, and if you don't happen to work for uh, an organization who has made that investment, um, retail Power BI Premium P1 SKU uh, starts at a retail cost of about $5,000 a month. Um, if, if you work in education or um, for a not-for-profit, um, and for a variety of reasons, you can get discounts from Microsoft, and that could go all the way down to about uh, eighteen hundred or two thousand dollars a month, depending on the type of organization that you work for. But if you don't have that luxury, and this is something that you want to do development work against, or just get some experience, you can actually set up a Power BI embedded service, and you can turn that on and off, and you're only charged when it's on. And uh, the A4 level, the A4 tier, is, um, has the equivalent um, features uh, to a Power BI P1 premium SKU. So um, 
using the A4 level, that'll cost you roughly about $8.50 an hour when it's running. I actually have a post-it note right here on my monitor that says, remember to turn my embedded service back off because I don't have, um, and I'm gonna bug Mike Wall for some help with, with the PowerShell to, to create a logic app to turn that off. <laughs> anyway, I have to remember to go positive, otherwise I'm gonna run up my, uh, my, uh, my mm -hmm. credit. So I'm actually just going to show you. Make another how, post it. What, what's that, Mike? Make another post it to remind yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's another post it to remind me to bug my friend Mike Wall to help yeah. me with the, uh, set up the, the, the PowerShell. All right, so I'm going to just jump over to my, um, my uh, Azure tenant here. And so you can see that I, I've already created a Power BI embedded service, and that was super easy. I, I go to the Power BI or the uh, uh, Azure portal. I go to services, I add a new service, I find the Power BI embedded, I light it up, and it says, what service tier do you want? And if if I just uh, jump over to my overview, let's see, to my chain size right here, you can see that uh, when I initially start this up, it, it, it's going to default to an A1, which is which is much cheaper. Now this is estimated cost. If it were running uh, 24 hours a day for an entire month, then that estimated cost would be $750. But to get this to the same level as a premium capacity P1 SKU, you can see that the estimated cost is $6,000 if I let it run all the time. So I can just resize that anytime I want. And um, then I can just hit pause, and it takes about 30 seconds to, to a minute to, to change the, the service. So once that is set up, then I can jump over to my Power BI tenant. And, and I'll just mention that even if you have a trial subscription to Azure, or if you have an MSDN subscription and you get the $150 um, you know, credits per month, then you can still do this. You just need to really watch the clock when you're running these services. So here in my Power BI subscription, let me maximize that. I'm going to jump over to the admin portal. And you'll see that once, once I light up a, uh, a capacity, either a premium capacity or an embedded capacity, when I go to the capacity settings, you'll see those capacities automatically show up as long as I'm, I'm using the, the same Active Directory tenant. So you see I don't have a premium capacity, but I do have two embedded capacities. One of them is running, this one's paused, and there you can see the, the same uh, capacity that I set up earlier. You can see that it's running at, at the A4 tier. Now, uh, before I leave the admin portal, I'm also going to go down to uh, this capacity. And we're going to go down to my workloads. And you'll see that there's my XMLA endpoint setting. Let's just jump down to that. And you can see that um, right now I have it set to read write. Now, by default, it's going to be read only. The read only um, uh, option has actually been there for about a year and a half now. So this is this is not brand, brand new, but the read write capability is fairly new just in the last couple of months. And that's what I have switched on. Okay, now I'm going to jump over to my workspaces. And I'll just go down to my presentations workspace. You can see that, that this workspace is in premium capacity because of the little diamond. So if I go over to the settings, So I can get to stuff on the premium tab now, and if we zoom into that, you'll see that one, I have dedicated capacity turned on, so that's using my reserved capacity that I'm renting from Microsoft, and I have this workspace connection. So this is my, my workspace endpoint address. So the, the XMLA endpoint is a web service that's available in the cloud, but every workspace gets its own address. You see it's just the name of the of the workspace there at the end of of that path. Okay, so that's that's all you need to know in order to get this set up. So let's jump back here 
And uh, I've included screenshots in these slides uh, in case you want to download this deck. I will post this on my blog and I'll also send it to Vern so that he can post it on our website. Okay, so there's the endpoint address. And to get that, all you do is you just click the copy button, it copies it to your clipboard, and away you go. Now, what can you do with that? So I'm going to jump back here. I'm going to click the copy button. And I'm going to use the tool that we all know and love so much, and that is SQL Server Management Studio. You can see I already have a number of connections, but uh, just to go through the exercise, I'm going to make a new connection to analysis services. As far as, as SSMS knows, it's just connecting to an instance of SQL Server Analysis Services. It does not know that it's connecting to Power BI. So you can see that I've, I've pasted that address previously, so it was cached. And I'm using Active Directory with a password. I don't have MFA set up in my tenant, but if I did, then I would, I would probably use MFA um, so that I could you know, do multi-factor authentication on my phone. And then I'm going to use my credentials right here. Now, if you've got um, uh, uh, Azure Active Directory set up and it's integrated, then you could use the current user as long as you're logged in using that principle. But once I connect, as I already have, you can see that here, All of the data sets that I have published um, from uh, Power BI Desktop or any other means that I'll talk about show up as uh, analysis services databases. And they all have connections, tables, roles, and other stuff. So let me just get to the crux of this. I'm, I'm kind of preparing this as a, a 60 minute presentation, so I'm going to need to move through it pretty quickly. But I just wanted to, to uh, make the point that. Once I have deployed or published a Power BI data set, if that is in the right compatibility level, I can actually go down to any of my, my objects here and I can script those objects. Now, this isn't something that you can do in Power BI using desktop or any of the other tooling. But because we're actually connected to these data sets as, as an analysis services database, I can generate scripts. So I could go um, script those tables. I could script the entire database. Um, now there's some, some landmines and some caveats because this is new, but I could also uh, script a partition. I, I, this database that I've chosen is probably not in the right compatibility level, but at least I can demonstrate that I can script a partition. So if I were to go script this partition in my date table, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, th because this came from Power BI uh, desktop, we, we see this as uh, an M query. If I had published this particular data set from SSDT and I were connected to SQL Server, that partition would actually be a SQL query. So I could, I could grab that partition. And let me uh, let me go ahead and script the partition to a new window. Close that. Okay. And this is the um, the TMSL, the Tabular Model Scripting Language script to define a partition. So what I could do now is I could go create multiple partitions. Let's say that I want a partition by month. I would give my partitions uh, different names. I would modify the query. And again, imagine that this is SQL. Uh, if this were a SQL server source that uh, I had deployed from SSDT. And you could just say, select star from fact table where um, uh, year of my date column is 2020 and month of my date column is six. And that would be the June partition. I could create individual partitions and um, then run that script. So uh, I, I mentioned that this is TMSL and I'm going to go back to a slide and talk about what that is. Let's talk about how that works. So. Paul, I had a security well, question. That's okay. Yes, go ahead. So, the XMLA endpoint is allowing you, you can grant access to one or many different data sources, correct? 
the XML endpoint is the way that I connect to analysis services. And of course, there's a security context in that question, in that um, connection. So yes, I would need to grant access to that database that I connect um, using the XML endpoint. So uh, did I, I, guess I spend your, go, go ahead, Mike. I spun your question a little bit to try to make sense out of it. But keep going. No, and that's fine. I, I think what I'm trying to ask is I'm thinking, I mean, you know that I, I think about these sort of things as like, you know, how to get shuttle data from one place to another. So on the, so can you set up, for instance, could you set up like group access? So once you've granted, once you've made this data available through the endpoint, then could you set up granting access to like, for instance, a workspace or some other um, device in your tenant so that multiple users could then use the data for the reports and such? So this is a way to get that data. Absolutely. This is this is a, a slightly different topic because the, the XML endpoint is is really just the method that I use to connect. Now, who can connect and what can they see and what can they do? Um, that's that's done through role-based security. And so for an for an analysis services database, let's step out of Power BI and just talk about analysis services because that's what's going on behind the scenes. An analysis services database um, has roles. Now, um, as a developer, I'm going to be in an admin role. To be able to run scripts, to be able to create objects, you have to be in the admin role, and that's just this deity-like role. But um, I, I can create additional roles, user-defined roles, and um, then add members to those roles. And those members could be AAD groups, that could be individual users. And then I can uh, implement role level security or just, just you know, grant access to a user to be able to connect to and run queries against this analysis services database. So th this is a topic that we could really get into the weeds with and it's, it's it's slightly related to what I'm talking about, but it's not really the center of this discussion. Oh, so, that, that's fine. Uh, I just care. I mean, yeah, and, and you are giving me lots to think about. So please continue with it. <laughs> and and we we will continue this discussion, but uh, uh, when when we have more time, let let me let me keep going and forge ahead. Um, so when we think about the the future of enterprise Power BI development tools. Um, Power BI Desktop was really intended to be a self-service tool. Now, it's the only tool that we currently have to build, you know, queries, data models, measures, and, and reports. It's very convenient. It's, it's very modern. Um, and in many ways, it's, it's more advanced than some of the, the legacy tools that we have. But it's really not focused on the enterprise. So, um, we now have the ability to design um, data models that we can publish to Power BI using SQL Server data tools, i.e. the analysis services tabular uh, designer that integrates with Visual Studio. Microsoft will continue to support that. There, there, there are some nuances to why this is a reality, but the bottom line is that all of the people who develop these tools work under the, the Power BI product team. They don't work in the SQL Server product team anymore. They don't work in the Visual Studio product teams. And because of that, you can really think of SSDT is in being in kind of high maintenance mode. Don't expect um, a, a, a lot of enhancements, feature additions, and innovation behind this tool. However, for the enterprise story, it's really necessary right now. So it's a little bit of a catch-22, but this is this is the reality that if you want to be able to manage objects at a low level, you want to manage, you want to do source control, you want to do multi-developer, um, you know, development of tabular models. Visual Studio is your tool today, but you just have to be aware that it's a tool that was designed a long time ago that that is is kind of in drift mode. So Microsoft will encourage uh, and, and support third-party design tools like Tabular Editor and DAX Studio. Um, because the product team is very focused on innovating and moving forward, 
they're really depending on the community to continue to advance this tooling forward. And that's a Microsoft thing. You know, for, for those of you who have worked in other platforms, you know that, um, you know, you don't have the same kind of community culture, you know, in the Oracle world or the IBM world or the SAP world that we enjoy uh, at Microsoft. But it's a double-edged sword because then we're depending on third parties to develop tools and who supports them. You know, what's, what's the SLA behind that tool? And I think the story is pretty good in our community, but, um, you know, Microsoft's not on the hook to, to support all of these tools. So what are your management options? So um, the, 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 the most straightforward way to build a data model that you deploy using the XMLA endpoint to a Power BI premium capacity workspace is to develop it using SSDT. That's the most straightforward method to do that. You just build an analysis services project like you always have. And you need to do it at uh, 1500 um, compatibility level, which is uh, SQL Server uh, 2019 analysis services. Um, and then you simply use the XMLA endpoint address, you can deploy it right out to your workspace. It's as simple as that. Then you can script and manage it. You have got the BIM file, uh, you know, check into source code repo, you can version it, you can share it, check it in, check it out. You know, you, so you have full lifecycle management. The second option, which um, is possible, but not, not super easy right now, is to start in desktop, Save your PBIX file out to a PBIT file after you turn on the new um, uh, metadata format option in, in, in options, which uh, essentially stores all of the object definitions of the PBIX file as clear text rather than A64 encoding. And then you can open that in tabular editor and resave it as a .bim file. Now I will tell you that I've done this and it works, but it's not perfect. And if we had three hours, we could walk through the whole process. And then you can manage that .bim file as part of a tabular project um, in Visual Studio. What you cannot do is reverse engineer that .bim file, the SSDT tabular project, back into Power BI Desktop. Now, I, I actually asked this question of a, a, uh, an internal uh, distribution list that I participate in. Uh, where we have you know members of the MVP community and and members of the product team, and I had a number of people come back and say, oh no no no, I can do that. I can hack the file. Let me show you how to hack the file. Microsoft's not going to support that, and there's just all kinds of, of of tripping points in that process. So just just know that this is kind of the the state of things today. Let me just talk you through some use cases really quick. Um, I, I recently had a a, a client who essentially said. I'm going to actually walk to this slide. So this is a real report. I've obviously blurred out because I have sensitive data here, so I can't actually show you the project. But so this is a, a, a report based on a, a really complex data model. We, we spent a good year or so evolving this to the point where we um, could present this data to a, an audience of financial analysts and controllers at a large uh, chemical manufacturing company. And, and so what we're, what we're showing here essentially by cost centers within a hierarchy, we're showing actual compared to forecasts, compared to different periods, um, et cetera. And um, uh, our, our user community came back and they said, all right, well, this is really, really complex. There's really complex calculations behind this report and it's hard for us to validate them. How do we know that they're right? Because every month we reprocess, we get new data, and you know we've, we've validated these results in the past, but how do we know that the new monthly numbers are good? We can go into SAP and run our reports, and we can get a number. Then we can go over here, and then we can eyeball that and see if those numbers line up. But that's a very arduous process. It would be really cool if you could take the results of this visual, this matrix up on the top here, and create another Power BI report that married that data up to a set of data that we will export out of SAP reports and then compare the two together and just compare them line by line. In fact, write some calculations that says, how close are these numbers? Do they match? 
are they within a certain percentage point? These are financial users. And so, you know, if we're off by a penny, they freak out. But, you know, if we're off by a penny, it, it could also be a rounding error. And, and so we, what we didn't want to do was destabilize our data set by adding a lot of enhancements to it. So th this is essentially what I did. I, I, I went to that visual uh, that, that I had blurred out there. And I pointed the performance analyzer in Power BI desktop at it. And um, I captured the DAX query that it generates. Okay, so all I did is I just clicked this link down here and uh, said copy query. Then I created another Power BI desktop file. And I created um, queries using um, the XMLA endpoint as a SQL Server Analysis Database connection. You can see that this is a, an analysis services connection. I'm using parameters here to capture my uh, instance name. That's my XMLA endpoint. And then the database name. And then I actually pasted that generated DAX. And I, I did, really didn't take much manipulation at all just to be able to run the same query against the same data set. And um, the result, oops, is not bad. Um, the result um, was a, um, a, a new data set, uh, right here, that is connected via that analysis services connection to essentially this data set. And in doing so, I was able to create a composite model, meaning I have a Power BI data model that gets its data from SQL Server and a bunch of Excel files in a, uh, a SharePoint library and the other data set. Now, it's not a live connection. Those queries run once, we have a static copy, we're importing that data. But I have tables that get reprocessed every day that just run a DAX query against that other data set. So it, it was kind of a poor man's um, method to create a composite model. I'm aware that I'm running short on time, so let me, uh, let me go ahead and wrap up with um, just some uh, resources. If you follow this first link, you'll see the announcement. This was in March of last year. Christian Wade announced that the, the read-only data point was, or the uh, uh, endpoint was available. And that's how you can connect to a data set as an analysis services database. Um, then in February of this year, Christian Wade also posted this blog um, uh, stating that the new read-write endpoint was available, which allows you to interact with that data set to script objects and to be able to, to uh, perform administrative tasks against it. Um, I have a blog post here uh, where I kind of talk about what I've done, and I'll continue to uh, to link this to newer posts as we continue to learn how to use this tool. So with that, um, let's take whatever whatever time we can afford to um, just field any other questions, and then we'll wrap up and give Jessica the rest of the time. Haven't had any questions come in yet, Paul. Okay. Well, with so. with, with that, I, I will go back to this slide and 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 wait for eight seconds of uncomfortable silence and ask <laughs> if you have any questions. Uh, that was nicely done. Yeah, it's that's eight right. seconds. At the count. Right. <laughs> All right, well, with that, um, watch watch my blog if you're you're interested in this topic because it's, it's kind of been uh, the center of my universe lately, um, but uh, I do appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Well, actually, Paul, we had one that just one that screamed in, which is probably something that Jessica can help. Jessica can help answer too. If I am new to Power BI, what's a good way to start? Or an example? Not with not with this presentation. No, not with this presentation. Um, I would say go to Microsoft Docs, but anyway. I'll be well, I, 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 I would say I would say take an online course from Pragmatic Works. Well, there we go. Um, there, there are a lot of good resources. Um, there, there, there. Um, Microsoft have actually put together um, a, a couple of different edX courses. Those are, those are free. 
Um, I mean, the, the Microsoft documentation and the short videos that they have at the Power BI side are, are a good place to get oriented. But I, I'm going to promote that Pragmatic Works because I, I really believe that we've got really good training content and it's it's quite comprehensive. But um, if you have specific questions, reach out to me. But there are just a lot of good resources out there from uh, SQL BI, that's the Italians, uh, uh, Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, uh, you know, uh, Ken Polk and and uh, and uh, Matt Ellington. Um, that, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of that company, but. And Reserad also has really good content. So those are some folks to Google. And I'd like to remind folks that while Pragmatic Works has a lot of great courses that they have online for a fee, they constantly are making uh, sessions and courses available online for free. I get an email almost every week about uh, a new a session of material related to BI and Power BI. And it's incredible stuff that's they're pushing out just to educate the community. And um, I, I believe that this, this offer is, is still open. If, if your career has been affected or your employment status has been affected by the, um, the COVID outbreak, um, Pragmatic, Work, Pragmatic Works, I should be able to say the name of my employer, um, will um, actually provide a free training subscription for you. And you're I'm, welcome to reach out to any of us at Pragmatic Works to direct that. I'm assuming that you mean negatively affected because I know I've got more work than normal. So I've been affected. <laughs> you know, a lot of us have. You're, you're right. And it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting oddity. Well, with, with that, I think we're ready to introduce the newest member of the Pragmatic Works family. That's Jessica Eggler, but uh, Vern, I'll let you uh, go ahead and make the transition. And, and, and the newest member of our leadership team. Yeah. Yes. Busy lady. And tonight, tonight, Jessica will be also talking about Power BI, only in a different, different area of it, comparing it uh, to our competitors. So I guess, uh, Jessica, it's all yours. There's competitors. All right. Can you hear me all right? It's Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start from the beginning. Can everybody see my uh, presentation? At least some of us can. Yes. We'll get that. <laughs> okay, just let me know if uh, something looks weird. So, um, so I'm going to be talking today about Power BI versus Tableau. Uh, I was inspired to write this slide deck because I worked for two companies and uh, the first company I worked for, I was really wanting to push Tableau and they went with Power BI. And then a second company I worked for, I was really pushing Power BI and they ended up choosing Tableau. And they based it not on a test drive, they based it on the price tag for their organization. And so I, I feel that your, how you visualize your data is really an important decision and what product you choose to use is also a very important uh, decision because you know, once you start down one road, it's you know, having to convert to a different product is kind of messy and time consuming and expensive. So I think it's worthwhile to test drive products. And so today, tonight we're gonna test drive Power BI and Tableau because those are the two I'm most familiar with. Okay, and I'm gonna try and get my, okay, I think that's working now. So about me, I am a new consultant at Pragmatic Works. I just started a couple weeks ago. Um, I wrote this slide deck before I started and I decided I wasn't going to change anything because I really wanted this to be a very, you know, uh, personally objective um, presentation as possible. Uh, I also joined the Oregon Data Community Leadership Team recently, so I've had a lot of big changes in my life. I'm also currently an MBA student at Washington State University. I have about six months left of coursework before I finally finish that chapter of my life. And I am on Twitter and in, on LinkedIn if you want to connect with me later on. Oops, my clicker's not working. Hold on. Okay, so oh, I have to turn it on. That's why I hate it when that happens. Okay, so 
the agenda tonight, we're going to be looking at the market, the pricing, the basic features of uh, Power BI and Tableau, um, some resources that I could recommend, and I'll wrap it all up at the end uh, and give some of my personal uh, opinions on the two products. So first, we're going to look at the market. Um, the business intelligent market is expected to grow 9.5% in a five-year period ending in 2021, and that is a pretty significant jump. I like to um, compare it to uh, the transition we all made when we went from writing all of our business uh, transactions on paper to moving to computers, and I, I we're, we're kind of entering a similar stage um, right now where a lot of companies either are newly adopting business intelligence tools, are, are getting ready to, or have already adopted them some time ago. I, I'm guessing that it will be as common to have business intelligence as part of your business setup as having a computer is in 2020. You just, everybody has it. And I think within about five years time or less, every business will have some business intelligence capacity uh, running in their organization. Globally, the growth from um, uh, business intelligence market is going to go from 17.9 billion um, in 2017 to 26.88. For anybody who likes to do quick math in their head, that's 58 or 57% growth in a five-year period of time. So that's really huge. Uh, and and it's interesting because with all the things that are happening in the market, the one area that has not slowed down is business intelligence. Uh, that market is still going like nothing in the world's happened. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see. And to wrap that idea up, data is kind of become the new oil. You know, it is where, you know, a lot of organizations have been collecting data for sometimes decades, and they are finally um, one of the companies I was working for, public sector, um, and they were just finally tapping into their data and, and discovering what they had, what trends they had, what, what, what did their, you know, KPIs look like. And so um, as businesses continue to do that and gain insights into what's happening in their industries, I think this is, this is going to be a very huge moment for um, businesses and technology. Um, this is the uh, latest uh, version of the Garter chart. And it, it, um, this is not a representation of the market share or earnings. It's rather a glimpse into the market research reports published by the IT consulting firm Gartner. They use uh, qualitative data to show market trends. So what we're seeing here in this uh, in their analysis on is the direction of the market, the maturity of the market, and where the participants in the market are fitting in. And the two companies we're looking at, Microsoft and Tableau, they are the leaders in, in the market right now. There's obviously a lot of other uh, participants and, and, and companies trying to gain um, market share and, and trying to challenge uh, Microsoft and Tableau. Uh, but looking at market share, Microsoft, um, Power BI, and Tableau, they hold about combined 20% of the market. And that's pretty significant if you consider how many players are in the field. So they, they definitely have a huge portion of the market to themselves. Uh, next, we're going to look at pricing because that is, I think, for a lot of companies, that is the decision. And that is how the decision is made on which product they're going to use. And I think sometimes there's this test drive is intended to kind of help people realize sometimes there's more to it than just the price. So the pricing options that we have with Power BI and Tableau, they both have a free desktop plan. And that's a great environment for people to play around and start uh you know, you can create dashboards, but you're pretty much developing them just for yourself because you have to, um, you can't just, uh, you actually can publish them onto the web, um, onto the web, but it's not, and it is free, but it's public, so you can't really 
publish anything to the web that it, ha it has sensitive data in it. So, um, but it's, it's, those are good resources if you're wanting to learn how to use Power BI or Tableau. And I know someone was asking Paul about that earlier, but that, that is a definite good uh, starting place if you're wanting to learn one of these two products. Microsoft. Hey, Jessica. Yeah. Uh, so since Sarah just asked the question and you just mentioned it, do you mind if you mind if I just go ahead and uh, and repeat my answer to Sarah? Sure. Um, so the the question is, can uh, she said can can Visual Studio be used to embed a Power BI report into a, a web application? Well, my answer is two parts. Um, the answer is yes. Um, so you you can easily embed a report um, simply by guide by publishing the report to the web where it it is is it creates an address that anybody could use to see that report. And so obviously you you don't want to do that with sensitive data, but even a free user can just publish a report to the the web. It generates an address, and then you can you can email that to somebody or you could put it in a frame. That's answer one. If answer number two is if you need to do that securely, then use the Power BI embedded service, which is actually a, an entire API toolkit that lets you programmatically um, embed Power BI content into a custom web application. And that's a deeper topic, but the answer is yes, but there's a cost and some, some programming involved. Thank you. Um, so, so going back to the pricing options, uh, Power BI has a pro plan, which is my 99 per user per month. And then when you get to the enterprise level, they start at 5,000 a month and go up from there. And I think Paul covered that pretty well, how far, how high that can actually go. Tableau has a creator plan, which is the equivalent to their enterprise level. You have a minimum number of users that you have to, um, uh, paid in the subscription. Uh, then they also have an explorer uh, uh, tier where you can develop and publish um, dashboards. It has a minimum of five users. Uh, and then there's the viewer, which has more of the read only. Uh, it, it has a read only access and it allows users to interact with the dashboards and, and data visualizations. So. That's how they separate the pricing. So here's kind of like a look at what you could possibly, you bill when you look at them, comparing them next to each other. Um, obviously Tableau on an enterprise level, you could probably save some money. But when I was, one of the reasons why the first company I was working for chose Power BI over Tableau is we actually only needed 10, uh, 10 uh, pro licenses. So we were only out a hundred bucks a month instead of, you know, a couple thousand. So in that situation, this was actually the more affordable option, but it really, it depends on what your, 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 your business needs are and you know, what your organization can afford. Uh, next, we're gonna go ahead and move on to looking at some of the basic features. And we are going to start uh, with kind of a comparison of the two. Um, both both Power BI and Tableau are subscription based. They're both software as a service, and with Power BI, they only have an on-premise uh, license uh, with the premium license. Uh, so you only can um, do do the do that with an on-premise uh, premium license. Both of them have the option uh, of being available on desktop, web, and mo mobile versions, so iOS and Android. And the one big difference between the two is that Tableau can run on a Mac or PC pretty seamlessly, and that for some people is kind of a big uh, deal. Power BI it is a, you know, it's Microsoft, so it's a Windows application only. So in order to run on a Mac, you would have to run a remote desktop 10 to, to get it to, to work. Some of the core strengths between the two products, um, Power BI has you know really easy functionality for data prep and visualization. Um, the visuals that you're offered are easy to use, easy for end users to manipulate, and and definitely create a really good end user experience. Same goes for Tableau. Um, they have you know I mean 
a lot of their charts that they offer, you're going to have your bar chart, you're going to have your line charts, you're going to have your scatter plot. So there's some basic standard ones, and then they they have a few things that are unique to their own uh, product line. Um, one of the things I like about Power BI is they have a uh, you can get visualizations through their marketplace, and I'm going to cover that more further on in this, um, but. That is where uh, people come in and they develop uh, visual add-ins and they put it on the marketplace. Many of them are free and, you know, it just gives you more options when you're visualizing data. It kind of keeps it a little fresh, fresher in my opinion. And uh, they also have, uh, you have the option of creating visualizations using using natural language in their q and feature. So they have a, in their visualization pane, they have a little a box that looks like a, a chat box and it's you, you can use you know you can say what is what are the totals of my sales for 2019 and it will render a visualization uh for you i personally haven't used it very much but it's a good it's a good tool for um uh for some users they also have uh the use of cortana as a personal assistant that is through uh the uh, pro licensing you have to download it on the web uh, web app I again haven't used that myself and it's a good resource for someone who wants to just get a quick idea of a you know pretty non-complicated um, measure visual um, Power BI also has a really quick response to complex data that kind of goes the same with Tableau. They both are pretty neck and neck when it comes to their responsiveness. And, um, you know, Tableau is kind of known for it, their easy drag and drop functional, uh, function, functions to create visualizations. You can literally drag columns into the um, pane and just, it will give you a suggested visualization. Power BI does the same thing, but yeah, you know, they're a little bit different. It's it kind of comes down to personal preferences, I think. Jessica. Yeah. Uh, so this question ties in right in the section you, you were just on. Uh, a fellow asked about could you touch on the learning curve for the two, and I think you kind of answered that, but maybe maybe he wants a summation. Yeah, you know the Power BI has a lot more, I think, moving parts. And so I think the learning curve on it is a lot steeper. Tableau, I think most users can get in and be proficient enough after you know a few hours. I sometimes worry about people trying to get too creative with Power BI who are experienced because you know there there is you know the element of needing to validate your data, and I think some people sometimes jump into it and then just create things and think they have insight and maybe they have broken code or they're not looking at it, you know. Um, I, I, Paul kind of touched on it, how, you know, you, you could think you have a, comp, you know, you, you run a complex code and you think you have it right, but you really do have to kind of be able to validate it. And a lot of times um, uh, less experienced users don't, don't have the tools yet developed to do that. So, um, but yeah, I think Tableau is a much easier product for people who have less experience in business intelligence. I think you'll have more, you know, I think you'll have probably more reliable dashboard. It'll probably be a little bit less frustrating than using Power BI. So, um, on the data source connections, uh, Power BI has over 80 connectors. Tableau has also over 80 connectors. So again, any source that you're going to be able to pull from with Power BI, you, you're probably going to be able to pull from with Tableau. So they're pretty much identical as far as that goes. Um, the data connectivity capacity um, with Power BI Pro, you have a one gig limit, but that is, you know, and premium is capacity based so that starts at 5,000 and goes up to um, a lot more. Tableau, on the other hand, does, uh, you're only limited by your data source hardware, so they don't uh, have any of those restrictions. And direct query and live connection with Power BI is the same in that it's only, it's limited by the data source hardware, um, how much you can actually 
connect to. So I actually built in quite a, a stopping point for questions. So uh, after I kind of cover a topic, so if anybody has any questions right now about what we just looked at. Uh, well, I'm trying to think, uh, here's one that definitely would, uh, can you share your output on the free tier of Tableau? Can I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Can you share your output on the free tier of Tableau? I think they mean, can you share your reports? Oh, can you share the report? Uh, you know, you can um, you can publish it to the web, but it's public, so don't post anything that's sensitive. Um, you can also create it in a workbook and share it that way, so you can share it over email, which is, again, the same with uh, Power BI. They're, um, they pretty much have the same features as far as that goes, so yeah. But okay. you, the short answer is yes, you can. But be careful because they, the the data is public, so you want to be careful with that. Sure. That's a danger anytime you publish something. Um, another question, which I think fits in right now well, is did the companies you were working with take into account the cost and administrative overhead of running and managing on-premise infrastructure for Tableau versus the SSAA offering SAS offering of Power BI? um we were our our data was yeah um well with the one company our data was on prem and it it, it came yeah i don't I, I think really you know at the time my boss she took a um department that had nothing and created something and when i came in they had no power uh, business intelligence tools at all and being as we were dependent on federal dollars you know we had to go with the most affordable option, which for us was Power BI, getting 10 licenses and having three developers and uh, seven people who viewed content. So, so, no, I don't think those other extenuating things were considered. I think it was just, oh, we can do business intelligence and we could do it for $100 a month. And that was pretty much how that decision was made. Okay, that's great. Uh, the last question I think is, we would be looking at an on-prem solution. Is there any advantage with either product for on-prem report sharing? Um, it's I, that, that's a tough question because I think um, they're both very, really, they're both really good products, and I think it really comes down to personal preference, which is why you know I suggest test drive the car. Don't oh, just pick it because you like the color and take it home uh I, you know i think everybody's going to have you know their their biases in and and that you know and you have to look at like what are you wanting to do you know and whether it meets your you know i see a lot of companies that do more like um science-based analysis they tend to lean more towards tableau whereas more um traditional businesses um, tend to lean more towards Power BI. But I'm seeing some of the other um, players in the field also starting to get some traction like Looker and um, mostly Looker is, is the one that I've been seeing more frequently. And I haven't actually used that one, so I can't really speak to it. You've summed up pretty well. I mean, it really gets down to, you know, cost and then company culture too. And that's really the main thing. I mean, you've already, you've said it, that go ahead and test drive the car and see what happens. So, to, so I think that's it for now for questions. Um, okay. and there's lots of other questions, but uh, I think the, those all fit in with where you were in your presentation right now. Okay. So I will keep going. And so we're going to first look at the Microsoft Power BI uh, layout. And I, I do have these particular dashboards open. So if you want me to open them and show you anything in the actual reports, just, just let me know. But uh, see here, we're gonna first look at this side, uh, this on the left-hand side. It is your left-hand navigation pane. It has your reports view, your data view, and your model view. We're currently looking in a reports view, which is where you see the dashboard and, um, your uh, 
tools for creating visualizations. Um, and that is this particular uh, icon here at the top in red. Uh, we have the data view, which is where you can look at uh, the what's inside your columns and your tables. And uh, it's a really, I, I spend a lot of time personally in this view, just trying to understand data and, and, and what I'm looking at and why, you know, it, it's also a really good place to do data validation. Uh, you can compare against your source data, you know, to make sure that everything came in the way it should. I've seeing inconsistencies in one source and just, you know, being able to compare them between the two is really, really helpful. And this right here is our model view. This is, I, I like the layout of this because I, I like seeing um, my table names, how they're related, what kind of relationship they have. Um, and I, I like being able to see the columns within the table. Uh, this is, again is a really useful view. So, you know, if one of your visuals isn't working, you can look in the model view and see if it's an issue with the relationship because oftentimes that is the source of uh, a lot of problems. And, uh, okay, so here we have the home pane and uh, this is a where you're going to import your data and do uh, a lot of your um, measure development, you, you, you have a publish pane, uh, you have tabs to do inserts of um, new columns, new measures, modeling, you have your view panes, the modeling will get you into Power Query Editor. Uh, and this right here is your visualization pane. Uh, this is this is your standard set of visualizations that you um, that are kind of out of the box. This is your fields pane, and uh, it's where your data tables and their associated columns reside. And these right here are the field and format pane. There's also an analytics icon that uh, is to the right of the roller brush, the format pane, and that is for certain visualizations that are chosen with, uh, and there's data that can be used with the feature it offers, such as like a trend line with a line chart, um, you'll see that appear. But if you cannot do analytics in the visualization you chose, it disappears. Um, the field view icon has two dotted rectangle, rectangular cells and the format pane is represented by uh, the paint, paint roller. And that's, if you have a hard time seeing that, that's what it looks like a little bigger. Um, this is, this ellipses is where you click to get into the marketplace, which is, uh, I'll be showing you that here soon. And this is an example of a um, visual add-in that I imported from the marketplace. And that's actually this uh, flow map right here. So just to give you a quick rundown of how to bring in a visual from the marketplace, because I think it's so good to see how easy it is. You start here, you, you click on the ellipses, uh, you get this drop down menu and you import from the app source. From there, you, uh, you enter the marketplace and you can either type in the, uh, the visual add in that you want or you can look through categories. In this example, um, I chose a chiclet slicer, so I'm going to click add, and as you can see, oops. As you can see, that icon shows up in my visualizations pane and it is ready to go. It takes less than a minute to import a uh, visual add-in to your visualizations pane. And there's some uh, another thing I'd like to point out is this, this little check here lets you know that Microsoft has verified that this particular add-in is um, legit and won't cause you they, they, they vetted that particular and they give it kind of a thumbs up. And again, there's the chiclet slicer there and 
There are over 250 visual add-ins in the marketplace, many of which are for free. There are some that you can pay for, but most of them by and large are, are there's, there's quite a nice selection of free ones. Uh, any questions about the uh, layout of Power BI? Uh, none, none so far, Jessica. Okay, so we're going to move on and we're going to talk about DAX. Um, what is DAX? Well, it's the scripting language used to create columns and measures in Power BI. It has many of the same functions and operators as Excel and several other Microsoft products. If you've used any of the listed Microsoft products in the slide, learning DAX is going to be much easier for you. Um, DAX is used to create, again, columns and measures. Uh, creating columns are good when you want to do slicing on your data, but beware that they can take up a lot of space as they're stored uh, in the file, and so it can be, it, it can really um, drag down your uh, file size if you're dealing with big data. So. Just keep that in mind when you're building columns. Uh, measures, on the other hand, um, can go only in the value section of a visual. Measures are evaluated when the visual gets rendered and they are always filtered depending on what visual you're using them on. In a table, they're evaluated once for each row in the table. And in a chart, they'll be evaluated once for each data point in the chart. Measures, uh, one of the nice things about measures is that they do not store any data, so they don't impact your file size very much. Um, they're useful for calculating totals, uh, ratio to parent, ranks, differences for averages, uh, really great for time intelligence, and, and so on. Um, the one thing about measures, though, is that they're more difficult to write than columns because they tend to be less intuitive. And having said that, they are basically the secret sauce to um, to Power BI, and they're absolutely worth learning. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, so this is going to be an example of some DAX. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bigger and highlight it. Uh, as you can see, many of the same functions and operators that are common in programs such as Excel are used in this example. And so for those people who, you, who do use Excel, um, these should look pretty familiar. You have your max, your top end, your summarize, your calculate, your minimum, um, and an ascending order uh, in, in this particular uh, piece of script. So that's kind of this is probably a little bit more complicated than you know you can do simpler obviously you know just divide between two you know two measures but um this kind of gives you a taste of like the things that can be thrown in that are common across different microsoft products and this particular measure is right here on the right hand and measures are um, have a calculator icon to differentiate them from tables and columns and tables. Any questions about DAX? None so far, Jessica. Chicken? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move to Tableau and look at the layout of Tableau. Um, so when you go into the model view of Tableau, it's a little different. Once you've imported your data, you basically drag it from the connections pane onto a, a, a model view pane. And you from there, you can see information inside the tables. You can do your data modeling from there. Um, it's a little, it has a different flow than um, Power BI, which uses more of the traditional um, tables with column um, view. Some people really like this, you know, so it's, it's all kind of 
comes down to personal preference. Um, here is a dashboard in uh, Tableau. Um, in Tableau, you create worksheets, you create dashboards, and you create stories. And it's kind of like a, a bit of a hierarchy. So you, oops, okay, sorry. So down below um, are the icons that are used to create each. The first one is for worksheets and dashboards and stories. You create worksheets that go into a dashboard and the dashboards are used to create stories. And I'll show that a little bit more as we get into this. So this is, this is just a single visual and this is what a worksheet looks like. You have your traditional uh, home ribbon where you can import your data, you can pivot and pivot. A lot of the features, they have analysis feature and dashboard uh, tabs and a lot of the things that you can do from the ribbon pane, you can also do within the visual. So there's usually two or three ways to do the same function. So it's, I think harder to get lost. Maybe it's easier. I, I don't know. I, I I think it's nice to be able to know that if I can't find it in the dashboard, I can just go to ribbon pane and peck around there and see if I can find you know whatever function I'm looking to do. Below here is the dimensions pane. Uh, dimensions are going to be things like area code, which is symbolized by uh, a globe. So that's that would have kind of a map feature dates are symbolized by calendars and then any string measures are have an abc icon measures on the other hand are pretty much going to be uh symbolized uh, the icons are hash hashtags or pound symbols um and that's to to differentiate the two so dimensions are going to be attributes measures are going to be calculations uh, okay, so, ooh, oops, sorry. Okay, so here is the column and rows um, pane. It, this is where you're going to drag dimensions and measures from the data column panel to your visual. And once you drag, uh, you know, in this example, we we put year to call uh, year to columns and sales to rows, and so inside Tableau, they're going to make an automatic recommendation, which you see right here. Now, if you decide you don't like the choice that the program suggested, you can change it to a bar chart. You could change it to whatever you want. And then in this pane, you can also take. Uh, so I you I took. Um, uh, the, the from the date table I took a year and I also moved it to color so that I could actually uh, look at the years um, so earlier years were lighter color darker years are, are, dar are darker green this is very similar to the conditional formatting feature in um, Microsoft products which you can also do in Power BI I also um, in the marks card, you have um, you have uh, you you have control over size, so you can change column size, you can change bubble size, you have labels, so you can add labels to your um, visuals. So data points here could have you know actual values for what it is at, at that point. You have detail, which kind of adds to your tooltip. Um, there's also tooltip customization. So, you know, when you bring in a, a, a visual, if it's, you know, the detached price, but that doesn't really make sense in a tooltip, you can just rename it to, you know, price. And um, so the, the, mark, the marks card is kind of where you do a lot of your formatting um, in Tableau. You also have your filter pane and you can filter on measures and or dimensions and create a legend using um, the information. 
And then the Pages pane can be used for time series animation, um, like with a scatter plot that has bubbles that move with time series changes. So that's a, a, another really useful uh, pane to use in Tableau. So again, worksheets are used to create dashboards. Dashboards are used to create stories. So we're going to move on to a uh, dashboard. And all of your um, worksheets are going to be down here on this bottom row. So this, this is an example of a dashboard. All the worksheets that were built are going to be found uh, on the left-hand side here on, and in this uh, pane. And the worksheets that were used in this particular dashboard are going to have a check mark next to them so that you can identify which pages have been used. Uh, when you are uh, customizing the page, you can uh, these are the, the legends, and, uh, oops, let me see here, uh, the, let me go right here. Here are the legends, and so these here, can uh, you can use them or you can hide them. Um, if you only, let's say, want to look at things um, through the uh, year of date, you can hide the other two, and you can make that particular legend float and then you can move it anywhere on the page to uh, just customize the page. Um, this is a story. So the difference between a dashboard and a story, so in stories you have multiple pages. So you can do page one, page two, page three. You can add annotation to your story to explain to the end users what is, you know, where wh what's the beginning, what's the middle of the story, what's the conclusion and add context to the visual. Uh, in, in this view, you see the first dashboard, second dashboard, which is going to be page one and page two of this story. Any questions? Um, i trying to think there's some questions here, but some of these are kind of big. Um, I guess the one question is, is it easy to work with the data model in Tableau, for instance, view and edit relationships? Yes, I, I, I think that working with a data model in Tableau is not terribly difficult. Um, I don't think it's any more or less difficult than Power BI. It's just, it just really depends on what your preference is. You know, I, whether you like the table format or whether you like the kind of the more of the flowchart look. You're breaking out. Um, and does RBI have a similar construct? Sorry. Let me try it a little louder too. Does Power BI have a similar construct as the story in Tableau? Um, I don't know if that is a tough question. No, and they um, in in Power BI when you create a dashboard, you kind of do all your work inside one pane, so you're not having to build each piece and then assemble it onto a bigger thing and then assemble it onto yet another bigger thing. Um, the pages in Power BI can be uh, independent or dependent on each other, depending on, again, what how you're reporting. So you, you essentially have the same capabilities. It's just rendered a little bit differently. Okay. All right, that's it for now. Okay. So table calculations and calculated fields. So in... Tableau, you, ha uh, you can click on one of your pills and you'll get a drop down menu as you can see this uh, arrow down right here. And you can select quick calculations. Um, Power BI also has a feature where you can do quick calculations. I believe they have 27 that you can do. Um, but I think, and maybe this is just me, but I think there's a culture in, in Power BI where it's just like a little bit shameful to use a quick calculations. Like you just don't do it. You're expected to know how to write that code. And so I would never admit to using them and I don't use them for that reason. 
but in Tableau, there doesn't seem to have that, you know, like gross factor. So I use them and I think they are great. And um, they're, they're again, not something I used all the time, but they definitely helped a lot in, uh, in, in writing reports. Now uh, in this- one, okay. Actually one comment though, is that if one person asked that uh, if it's possible, if maybe you can use your mouse cursor. I understand that these are all static slides, but maybe you could do a little bit, maybe more pointing. Okay, okay. On so, the, on so the slides when you say here, uh, they ask for that. Okay. So uh, here we're, we, we go to the quick table calculation. We're gonna do a percent of total. And uh, you're going to see the, uh, y-axis change when I, I enact that. So as you can see right here, the total of sales volume turned to percentages. In addition, the pill changed to show a triangle, which in math is uh, symbolizes change. So this, this lets the user know that they have changed the pill. Now it is only changed in this context, in this row. It is not changed in the measures table. You can't, if you want to keep a, a calculation that you've done to a pill, you can do that, but it's not going to be automatically assumed. And again, here is the, the change uh, in, in sales volume went from thousands to percentages. Um, you can also create calculated fields of your own. Um, you, there's a drop down uh, here. You can also do it through the ribbon and you choose the cal create calculated field. When you click on that, you will get moved to this box. Um, and I just created a really easy uh, calculation where if the sum of the sales are greater than zero it will show true and if it's less it'll be false so it's a boolean uh, measure when i click ok in this you're going to notice that it shows up here on my measure table because a boolean is seen as being a measure because it's basically true false zero one and i will see that's a little bit bigger for anybody. So, uh, so the, the one difference you will see aside from longitude and latitude being obviously location is you'll see uh, true false as another option in your measures table. Any questions about creating measures and calculated fields in Tableau? Nope, you're clear. Okay. So I'm gonna discuss some resources and these are anybody can go Google online and find a lot of different resources. This is kind of my weeding through a lot of that and, and sharing what I've found personally to be of most use to me. So all of these have been kind of vetted through me. <laughs> so for Microsoft Power BI, the free resources that I have found to be most valuable have been um, using, of course, the Microsoft website. They have a um, document section where they, you know, reference uh, DAX functions. They give examples of how to use different um, functions and operators. It's a really good resource um, and it's free. Um, Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, the Italians, they run uh, SQLBI.com blogs and they are another really fantastic source. They also publish uh, YouTube videos, which can, be found online. And then my final favorite free resource is Guy in a Cube. Um, it's two guys who work for Microsoft and they, um, they do videos, I think, at least once a week and they cover a lot of topics and they're usually between, you know, about four minutes and eight minutes in, in length. So they cover a lot in a really short amount of time. So it kind of feels like a bit of a sprint when you're uh, learning these new skills. Um, the paid resources, uh, of course, Pragmatic Works. They have um, Microsoft certified professionals who offer uh, trainings and they are modularized. So, you know, you can start a training and, you know, usually each module is about, you know, between five and 10 minutes long. So it gives you decent breaks in between if you want to push through, but you're also not committed to sitting through two hours if you don't have two hours of time. 
and those uh, trainings start from beginning level uh, Power BI to advanced Power BI usage. Udemy is another really good resource, but the downside of Udemy is that they are, um, anybody could be an instructor on Udemy. You don't have to have any credentials to um, publish a training video. So there's some good stuff in there, but there's also some stuff that's more eh. Um, the books that I have enjoyed the most are The Definitive Guide to DAX by Marco Russo and Alberto uh, Ferrari. That is kind of like my, my golden go-to book for first line of defense. Um, I, I, I like this book so much. My husband also does work in Power BI and I made him get his own book because I didn't want my book wandering off. And I like to mark my pages. So, and then um, the final book I have is Beginning DAX with Power BI. So for some more of the um, people who are looking to learn and are kind of like stepping into beginning stage uh, development, this is a really good resource. It'll walk you through a lot of the um, basic DAX and give you plenty of examples and plenty of resources to um, continue developing your skill. Um, Tableau free resources. Yeah, the Tableau website, that's it. I have yet to find anything that I was absolutely in love with that I would recommend as a good source. Um, the really nice thing about the Tableau website though is they do have a lot of training videos. Um, when I was an undergrad, my the product of choice was Tableau. So I learned business intelligence first with Tableau and our instruction was basically to watch these videos and learn how to use the product. and it did a good job. It did a really good job. Um, some of the paid resources, again, Pragmatic Works does have a library of um, Tableau training courses, um, and they start you out beginning beginner level and can work you all the way up to advanced. Udemy again is another option. Uh, again, they don't anybody can be an instructor on Udemy and. They do have a lot of good videos, but there's also some that are just not as great. So just be careful if you, uh, when selecting your courses, if you use that as a resource. And then my book of choice is Practical Tableau by Ryan Sleeper. It's a really good book. It has, um, walks you through a lot of uh, intermediate and more advanced dashboard design and how to create some of the, you know, uh, Visuals that are kind of outside the built-in built-in ones. Just I, I I like trying out new visualizations because I try to keep my my visualizations kind of fresh and not feel like oh it's another bar chart. <laughs> so I mean sometimes you need another bar chart, but sometimes you can put a little splash of something new in, and so that's kind of fun. So here's my conclusion. Um, I'm going to weigh in on the pluses first. Um, with Power BI, you have robust functionality. Um, for me, the marketplace is a huge plus. I, I love going in the marketplace. I, I feel like a kid in Toys R Us because it's just a fun place to look and just play with different visuals. Um, one of the things that I also really like about Power BI is I can create all my visuals in one pane from start to finish. And if I want to use a certain visual in another view, I can just cut and paste it in to the other uh, sheet. In addition, Power BI has tons of support from the Power BI community. It's just so much support. It's real. I mean, I, I didn't even mention Stack Overflow. And, and again, that's a great free resource for, um, you know, just looking at problems and seeing how other people uh, found solutions. Um, the pluses for Tableau is it does have a really short learning curve. Um, dragging and dropping pills to create visuals is super easy and, you know, it, 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 it feels just a little less intimidating, I think, when you're, you know, just starting to learn how to, you know, create visuals and, and, and work in business intelligence. Um, creating calculations is also really easy to learn. Uh, in, in, in the cell, I didn't, I, I wasn't able to show you, but you can just drag your columns over if you want to and it will just auto-populate in the pane and, you know, you can just whip together a bunch of calculated measures in, in no time at all. Um, Tableau is also 
a more affordable option if you're looking for enterprise level of support. So, you know, that is obviously a big consideration for a lot of uh, people out there. Now, here's the negatives. <laughs> Power BI does take more time to learn, but you, 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 it pays in dividends if you do take the time to learn it. Um, and there is a high cost for the enterprise level of support. I mean, it, it can get pretty, pretty expensive. Tableau um, it has less functionality. And I personally, I do not like having to create each visual individually because it feels for me like that whole pain just gets cluttered because every every single visual you're creating has to have a sheet and it just it, it, it just feels for me kind of cluttered and I don't particularly like that about Tableau so any final questions for me Mike? Sorry, uh, my network connection has been a little weird, but no, there are, any, there are not any new questions other than someone did uh, mention that one number dot biz has a great blog on Tableau stuff. And there were several thank yous. Yes, lots and lots of thank yous. Uh -huh. Can you uh, go back slide yeah, on the menu? So, so we, are we going to do the eight seconds of awkward silence then? <laughs> eight minutes and 46 seconds. Can you go okay. back and slide on the negatives? Well, I'm sorry. Go back to your slide on the negatives. Okay. So I think what, have a question. one of the things that's really showing up in the in the comments and questions, Jessica, is that the value of this comparative kind of presentation is is very well received. Oh, it's been a thank lot of you. good questions for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there was one question. Can you clarify what is enterprise level support? Um, so, enterprise. Actually, I think Paul might be able to speak on this more because I've only been able to exist on the lower levels of support. Because again, when I was working for the public agency, we never had anything higher than a pro, uh, pro license. And um, with Tableau, we didn't have anything. We didn't have the creator license. We had the tear down permit. So I haven't actually been able to work in the enterprise environment. I, I can comment. I can comment well, on that, Jessica. Paul, while you're commenting, Paul, Jessica, someone requests that you back up one slide. Okay. Go ahead, Paul. Um, so Jessica had a, had a very early slide where she was comparing costs. Now, my, my, in my short presentation, everything that I showed were um, Power BI premium capacity features, which Jessica uh, highlighted as a, a feature that begins at a retail cost of about $5,000 a month. So Microsoft really is going after enterprise customers with Power BI. The, the, the mantra of James oh, Phillips, uh, uh, go ahead again. The, the, uh, the, the mantra of James Phillips, who runs the, the, the Power Platform team, is uh, five seconds to sign up and five minutes to wow. And that, that really emphasizes that the, the self-service story is how Microsoft are hooking their customers, if we can you know put it boldly, making it very, very easy to sign up and get started. But they're really making their money by by um, signing up enterprise customers and essentially saying, if you pay for, um, I didn't realize my webcam just came on, I'm talking to my phone. Um, it, it, if you pay for this enterprise license, you pay for Power BI Premium, you don't have to pay for a user. Everybody in your organization 
can use and interact with reports and you don't have to pay for individual users. But it's a huge step between $10 a user per month and $5,000 for everybody in the enterprise. Now, we're going to see a, a mid-level price point where you'll likely, and I have to be careful about this, you'll likely see a per user cost for premium features um, that'll be far less expensive than $5,000 a month. But right now, it's a pretty big step between paying for a user and paying for the entire. Um, Okay, I have another question from Russ. It's, if you have a SQL Enterprise license on a server in-house, it includes report server, correct? Does O365 premium license include the developer level license or is there additional cost? Or for on-prem? I, Russ, maybe, yes, on-prem, Russ says. Okay. So here, here's here's a reality, and again, this is me not speaking on behalf of Microsoft because you won't you won't hear these words come from them. Microsoft wants you in the cloud, and and Power BI works best in the cloud. Now, if 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 and I, I saw a question earlier that that we need an on-prem solution. The question I have is, what do you need to keep on-prem? If you need to close your firewall and not allow people to use the internet in any way whatsoever, even if it's secure, then you know you need to be using Power BI, um, Power BI report server on-prem. You still have to have a SQL Server Enterprise license or a premium license to use that. And you know, a lot of people hear that and they think, oh my gosh, you know, that just doesn't make any sense. Microsoft doesn't want you to not use their cloud service. They want you in the cloud and they will make it convenient for you to do that securely and you can actually keep all of your data on-prem. So that, that's the answer. If you absolutely need to, to remain on-prem and, and isolate your servers from internet connections all to, well, isolate your users from using the internet, then Power BI report server is there. But the, the obvious, the the reality is that the pricing for Power BI report server is really not that attractive. So anyway, there, we need we usually have to kind of move the discussion to okay, why why do you think you need to be on prem? Let's talk about that and let's see if we can build something, um, you know, that's secure for you using the Power BI service. But you know, if you absolutely can't be there, then that's the answer is is you have to have at least a SQL Server Enterprise license. A continuation of that that same question, um, Richard says, I was the one talking about on-prem. We are high security government and the cloud solutions aren't quite certified yet. That's not really a question, but maybe either Paul or Jessica, you have a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I was in the same situation um, with, I worked for a public agency um, and we were on-prem for that very same reason is because they don't have the security for cloud for uh, certain government agencies yet. They don't, they're not meeting the criteria yet. So. Um, however, I, I, I will say that I've worked with a number of government entities where we have used the government cloud and the Power BI service within the cloud. And in some cases, we kept all of the data on-prem and used secure gateways. So I'm, 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 I'm not saying that there isn't a good on-prem uh, story. I'm saying that we need to fully understand if that doesn't meet your needs and you need to actually bring your reports on-prem. And, and if so, then you know, they'll revert back to the earlier answer, and that is the most cost-effective way to license that server is typically going to be with SQL Server Enterprise uh, licensing with software assurance. And just to you know, pitch the idea about the government cloud, always verify what level of service and security you're after, because there are actually multiple government clouds. I work on some that are incredibly high secure um, that have been through an immense amount of hack testing 
uh, intrusion testing, and there's you know it's it's a highly classified environment. So those types of clouds do exist. It depends upon the agencies and the work that the agencies are doing. Okay, here's a um, question. Jordan. Go ahead. Oh, go, go, go ahead. I just saw Jordan's question, but it's, it's, I'll, I'll let you field these. I, Mike had a question. Uh, how do accounts work with, in the Power BI SaaS cloud model? Does it require Azure AD to auth users? Um, out of the box, yes. So uh, Power BI uses Azure Active Directory for authentication. Um, that could be federated with your on-prem AD so that you know users who just log into their computers can authenticate. Um, uh, if if that doesn't meet your needs, then you could use Power BI embedded. It's a little more work, but you you know you could use token-based security or a single sign-on or something like that through embedded. Um, but you know, simple answer is that that we just use Azure uh, Active Directory out of the box. We had a couple of questions uh, for Jessica. One, uh, one was, so for a total newbie, is there a difference in the interactive interactivity of the reporting, things like drill down? Um, not really. I mean, how they, they basically both do the same thing and but there's going to be two ways of learning it so there's going to be the tableau way of, of drilling down and rolling up and there's going to be the power bi i would you know the, there tends to be a power bi camp and a tableau camp because and and people pretty much stay loyal to their side of the fence i i just personally happen to be in a situation where i had to learn both products and there is some adjusting when you switch from one to the other. So, um, but I would say they're they're both pretty. You know, once you've learned how to do one of them, it's it's pretty easy to do it again and repeat what you you know repeat the process. But both have you know you can build your own hierarchies. You can drill down by dates. You know, you can create filters and stuff. That they're they're they basically have pretty neck and neck features. I think honestly for, you know, it is a shorter learning curve of Tableau, but it also I think has to do with just personal preferences. I see a couple of questions that are related to Power BI embedded. Um, one was whether any other licensing covers embedding, and I think the answer is no that you, you, you just have to light up the embedding service within um, the, uh, your Azure tenant. And um, you it, typically to, to build an embedded solution, you, it, it requires that you actually write some code and, and you programmatically embed. I, I will say that a company here in, in Portland, CSG Pro, have an excellent um, uh, uh, kind of out of the box uh, embedded wrapper uh, that you, you essentially you buy their product, you set up embedding, and then your reports can just magically show up in a in a secure frame. Um, but typically, you know, it, it takes a developer to implement embedding. Let me see. Well, and then the other question was, I think it was Mike uh, about custom authentication, uh, DAML two authentication. Again, any custom authentication would require that you use embedding because Power BI only supports. Um, uh, AAD out of the box. Uh, Jessica, could you, could you bring up the resources slide while we're chatting? Sure. Uh, for which Tableau or Power BI? Uh, let's go with Power BI for now, and let's. Uh... Okay. They didn't specify. Yeah. Uh, Mike, that was CSG Pro was the name of the company that provides that wrapper for embedded. Charlie Sierra Golf. I just so, uh, I just answered. I'm going to assume people are using their phone to take a picture, so I'm going to go to the next slide. I'll I'll hold it there for like 20, 30 seconds.
Are you going to count on your count. fingers like Paul did? <laughs> We, we've been jumping around in the questions. I think we're trying to keep the subject um, consistent, but that also makes it difficult to make sure we answer, we've covered all the questions. I think we got most of the only other one I saw was there was one fellow who had asked about, uh, he said specifically for Tableau, can you explain more on the negatives, each visual individually meaning? And I'm not, um, I'm not not quite sure. I guess we'd have to see the negative slide again. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, here, here is my it's Tableau Visual. So in here, you had in order to create your da this dashboard, I have to create this as an individual sheet, this as an individual sheet, and this as an individual sheet. I can't. I, I, see, the, I see the paid resources slide. Oh, okay. Oh, let me see if I can change. Um, there you go. View. Oh, you can see it now? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so you can see a Tableau dashboard, right? Uh huh. Okay, so um, I'm, this is a stacked bar chart with a, a date slicer and um, so in order to create this particular visual, you know, I, I, I can't do another visual on this open white space. This is the, when I create a uh, worksheet, I only can create one thing. So you end up with this huge line of possible um, visuals that you could potentially use in your dashboard. And once you've created a selection of, of um, you know, visuals, then you can go into your dashboard and you can start customizing it and turning it into a dashboard. And, you know, like here you can go in and like, I want to have this floating. So I'm going to move this and, and, you know, put it somewhere else on the, you know, dashboard to, you know, you know, uh, let's see here, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to, um, uh, no title. So you, you can get rid of some of these dashboards and then you can move the one that you want to keep to, you know, another spot to just make your dashboard flow a little better. But, but I guess the point, and, and this legend will work with this entire dashboard if I, if I were to have like a drop down like between 1995 and 2016. Um, but again, you, you know, each, so the color date is a um, worksheet the bar chart was a worksheet, the line chart was a worksheet, and I had to literally bring them in to add them to my dashboard. They were not, I can't just create something from start to finish in a single pane. And that's that's what I don't like. I don't like not having I don't like being able to not being able to just create everything in one view. You know, the, what, what, one of the things that I, I think just drives us all crazy when comparing these two products, and you know, and, and Tableau and Power BI go head to head a lot, so this is a pretty common conversation, is that the, 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 the terms that are used in one product are not the same in the other product. And so um, the, the concept of a worksheet doesn't exist in Power BI, but there's a very worksheet-like environment, you know, that looks a lot like Excel, where you've got little tabs down at the bottom. And what you what you call a dashboard in Tableau is not a dashboard in Power BI. And you know, and so you, it 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 it's hard to say. Well, how do I create a dashboard in Tableau, and then how do I create a dashboard in Power BI? Well, a dashboard in Tableau is roughly equivalent to a report. Or maybe even a report page in Power BI, and but but we also have this dashboard thing that you can pin visual tiles onto in Power BI. So it it, it really gets a little confusing, and I've I've learned I've not learned to not correct customers just because it it becomes a little insulting after a while. But we also have to be very cautious about, you know, when somebody says, how do I create a dashboard that does 
X, Y, Z, what are they really asking for? And I don't know about you, Jessica, but it's, you know, it, it's this ongoing kind of laborious conversation with people. But all right, well, what do you really mean about a visual when you, you know, say the word visual or you say dashboard or you say report? Definitely the lingo is, I, I find myself still, you know, having moments of struggle where I'm like, Wait, okay, is that a pain in, in, in Tableau or do they call the pain in, you know, or, oh, no, it's a card, it's a card, it's a card in Tableau, a pain in, you know, and just keeping it straight, it's a challenge. Yep. Yeah, they're definitely very separate ecosystems and you, you really have to kind of drink the Kool-Aid, you know, yeah. for one product and follow it all the way through and then start over and do the same thing with the other product. Yeah, okay. I definitely agree. I think we might be at the end. I don't see any more questions coming in. Jessica, I think you had a pretty hot topic and, and treated it well. A lot of a lot of interest. That's very promising. Thank you. Yeah. So awesome thank you. presentation. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, next month, July, what is it, July 8th? Uh, we'll have um, our main presentation is Michael Wall will be presenting on Polybase and Don Crawford on the short session will be talking about uh, big data in, ancest in Ancestry. Um, and make sure to keep an eye on our website because uh, somebody in the next few days or several days will be the winner of some Pragmatic Works uh, uh, licensing. So uh, look at our website, send us an email if you have any questions and uh, thank you everyone.